What you're looking at are tiny bits of rock and metal under a device called an electron microprobe. The samples came from a rooftop in Brooklyn, but they might have traveled quite a ways to get there, possibly from outer space. We're at NASA trying to figure out whether they really are tiny meteorites, because if so, they could help unlock secrets you really wouldn't believe. So earlier this year, we set out to find a micrometeorite of our own. We wandered around a roof with a powerful magnet. We spent hours in front of a microscope. We got advice from a Norwegian jazz guitarist who also happens to be the world's foremost micrometeorite hunter. You know what? Just watch the other video. We'll put a link to it at the end. Anyways, the end result was this image. It's our best sample, the one most likely to have come from space. But the image alone isn't conclusive. We wanted to find out what it takes to positively ID a meteorite, and what scientists can learn from it. So we headed to NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston, where, well, we met this guy. You take a bee's head, right? You glue the bee's head to a carbon disc. Just look at the bee's head, and kids love this, right? You see the eyes, and the hairs are all moving around like this because they charge up and they swirl around. Mike Zelensky is a space scientist at Johnson. He's walking us through the electron microprobe. It uses a stream of electrons the way a microscope uses photons. Particles bounce off your sample and hit a sensor, returning a wonderfully detailed image of tiny rocks or anything else you put in there. I used to have a bee's head just for tours. And believe me, adults love it too. I mean, everyone loves looking oh, at the bee's yeah. head. It's amazing. Mike works within NASA's Astromaterials Research and Exploration Science Division. It's a very nondescript building at Johnson, but inside is maybe the ultimate cabinet of curios. Materials from the moon and Mars, dust from comets, flecks of asteroids, atoms from the sun. We're interested in the 60 to 100 tons of material from outer space that lands on Earth each day. Most of it lands unnoticed, but every now and again, a big meteor lights up the sky. And experts like Mike mobilize to collect samples from it. It all sounds pretty Indiana Jonesy. It's really fun. Yeah. Usually. <laughs> but someone has a gun, then it's not fun, right? You know. Does that happen? Yeah, sure, but it's okay. What? Long story, long story. Okay. <laughs> Mike's job is to wring every detail possible out of the samples that cross his desk. Some are big, like these two that he showed us. Samples that landed in Australia and Morocco. But our samples are only a couple hundred micrometers wide. We brought a few along with us. Our best candidate, plus a few bonus options. And one sample from our expert in Norway. To the naked eye, they're almost invisible. In our microscope, you can start to see some shape and texture, but in the electron microprobe, wow. We visited Houston to answer a simple question. Did any of our samples actually come from space? And to figure that out, we looked at two things, the shape of the rocks and the chemical elements present on their surface. The electron microprobe can measure both. We started with shape. So here's one of the samples that you found in, I guess, Brooklyn, right? Uh, this was a rooftop in Brooklyn. Yeah, wow. These are all spheres, so it definitely were melted in the atmosphere. The idea is that as a tiny object speeds through the air, it melts and globs into a little ball. But that can happen to earthly materials too, like bits of industrial pollution. The question there is, is it an extraterrestrial sample, or could it be from, say, a coal-fired power plant? The material makeup of our samples were less encouraging. IDing a meteorite often means finding elements that are rare on Earth's surface, but common in space. Things like palladium, platinum, uranium. But sample after sample, we saw very earthly elements. Iron, oxygen, silicon. So here's the second particle. Again, we see the same pattern. These little flattened crystals on the outside, which again are magnetite uh, over here, iron oxide. Right? It's probably terrestrial contamination. Our sample from Norway was much more exotic. These have these little uh, dendritic, like, like little fern-shaped uh, crystals of something else on the outside. Mike says that crystalline structure is usually the mark of a voyage all the way from space to the Earth's surface. But what really tipped the scales? The probe's readout showed lots of magnesium mixed with a little silica. And that's telling us this is another mineral called olivine, which is the most common mineral in the solar system, probably. And this is in almost every kind of meteorite and micrometeorite that I can think of. So this is almost pretty much nails this as being a micrometeorite. Olivine is quite common here on Earth, but it's largely found inside the planet. 
olivine can reach the surface via volcanic activity, but its presence still makes you take a sample like this seriously. And after 30 years in the business, Mike can spot olivine from a mile away. It's so common, you just recognize it instantly now, you know? It's like an old friend. <laughs> really old friend. Four and a half billion years, that's a really old friend, right? Yeah. So where does that leave our samples? What came of all those hours spent searching? Not much. Mike says he'd have to look inside the samples to be sure, but nothing seemed conclusive. We, we basically found magnetic dirt. Hunting down tiny rocks from space is laborious and frustrating, but for NASA, each verified sample truly is a diamond in the rough. Because if you know what to look for, and you find it, the whole galaxy opens up to you. We found meteorites like this that contain liquid water droplets in salt. So those are our first samples of uh, extraterrestrial oceans. Where were those environments? I mean, we don't know. We need to find that out. But now we're learning about, you know, what kind, what were the first steps toward perhaps life? First steps towards organized cells. Those are present perhaps in these meteorites. Other samples hold clues that could change our understanding of the solar system. Samples like this one. So this is a rock that is from an asteroid that's formed in the inner solar system. It heated up, melted, it contains a, uh, the composition suggested form in the inner solar system, but it contains bits of rock from the outer solar system. And the question is, how did those get mixed together? One theory, the planets weren't always in the position they are now. So the models have Uranus and Neptune swapping places. Saturn and, and, uh, and Jupiter moved in pretty far, then stopped, then moved back out again. And there's chances that we can date that process by studying this rock and other rocks like it. NASA has other samples still of very old cosmic dust, little motes of material that can teach us about the earliest days of the solar system. Some samples arrive via comets, which contain dust from the farthest edges of the solar system and dump some of it along the Earth's path. And once in a while, even rarer samples turn up, dust from outside the solar system, from before it. The galaxy is turning, and we're part of that. And as the galaxy spins around like a pinwheel, there's a rain shower of interstellar dust passing through our solar system. They're usually really tiny, and they're pretty rare, um, but that happens. Space is a paradox. It's vast and almost completely empty. Yet at the same time, it's teeming with material. We can study some things with telescopes and probes. Other times, we're stuck with models, mathematical guesses that tell us this is probably happening somewhere out there. Except sometimes, if we're lucky, actual physical evidence from out there happens to land at our feet. And then one little speck like this one can change everything. You can find grains that prove that supernovas happen the way we think they do or don't. There are grains from wolf rayet stars and red giant stars that tell us about the process of star uh, formation and, and death. Uh, it's pretty amazing that you can test all those those apparently strange, wacky theories astrophysicists have by looking at little microscopic grains and meteorites, but it's true. Hey everyone, if you want to find out how to collect your own micrometeorites, be sure to check out part one down here. And as always, thanks for watching.